By a happy coincidence, your theme is making it home. And a number of years ago, I wrote a short story called Making It Home. So I didn't have to think too long about what I would do when I got here. This is a story set in 1945, a year that's since 1945 never been very far from my mind, even when I was young and didn't understand uh, as much as I needed to about it. I just read a book by the historian John Lukacs called 1945. He called it the year zero, the year of great geographical and political uh, changes, changes of political and geographical configuration. And he's good on the subject. For me, 1945 has been a kind of fulcrum year. Uh, it's the year of the end of World War II, of course. But it's also the year when we became free to turn our great technical power that we had generated in order to win the war upon our own landscapes to apply that terrible doctrine of maximum force relentlessly applied to problems like crop insects and weeds with, as you know, dire consequences. Making it home. He had crossed the wide ocean and many a river. Now not, an, not another river lay between him and home, but only a few creeks that he knew by name. Arthur Roundberry had come a long way, trusting somebody else to know where he was. And now he knew where he was himself. The great river still raised somewhat from the flood of that spring and flowing swiftly, lay off across the fields to his left. To his right and farther away were the wooded slopes of the Kentucky side of the valley. That's the Ohio Valley. And over it all, from the tops of the hills on one side to the tops of the hills on the other, stretched the gray sky. He was walking along the paved road that followed the river upstream to the county seat of Hargrave. On the higher ground to the right of the road stood fine brick farmhouses that had been built a hundred and more years ago from the earnings of the rich bottomland fields that lay around them. There had been a time when those houses had seemed as permanent to him as the land they stood on. But where he had been, they had the answer to such houses. We wouldn't let one of them stand long in our way, he thought. Art Roundberry walked like the first man to discover upright posture, as if having been a creature no taller than a sheep or a pig, he had suddenly risen to the height of six feet and looked around. He walked, too, like a man who had been taught to march, and he wore a uniform. But whatever was military in his walk was an overlay, like the uniform. For he had been a man long before he had been a soldier, and a farmer long before he had been a man. An observer might have sensed in his walk and in the way he carried himself a reconciliation to the forms and distances of the land, such as comes only to those who have from childhood been accustomed to the land's work. The noises of the town were a long way behind him. It was too early for the evening chores, and the farmsteads that he passed were quiet. Birds sang. From time to time he heard a farmer call out to his team, once he had heard a tractor off somewhere in the fields, and once a towboat out on the river, but those sounds had faded away. No car had passed him, 
though he walked a paved road. There was no sound near him but the sound of his own footsteps falling steadily on the pavement. Once it had seemed to him that he walked only on the place where he was, but now having gone and returned from so far, he knew that he was walking on the whole round world. He felt the great empty distance that the world was turning in, far from the sun and the moon and the stars. Here, he thought, is where we do what we are going to do, the only chance we got. And if somebody was to be looking down from up there, it would all look a lot littler to him than it does to us. He was talking carefully to himself in his thoughts, forming the words more deliberately than if he were saying them aloud, because he did not want to count his steps. He had a long way still to go, and he did not want to know how many steps it was going to take. Nor did he want to hear in his head the counted cadence of marching. I ain't marching, he thought. I am going somewheres. I am going up the river towards Hargrave. And this side of Hargrave before the bridge at Elville, I will turn up the Kentucky River and go ten miles and turn up Sand Ripple below Port William, and I will be at home. He carried a duffel bag that contained his overcoat, a change of clothes, and a shaving kit. From time to time, he shifted the bag from one shoulder to the other. I reckon I am done marching, have marched my last step, and now I am walking. There is nobody in front of me and nobody behind. I have come here without a by your leave to anybody. Them that have known where I was or was supposed to for three years don't know where I am now. Nobody that I know knows where I am now. He came from killing. He had felt the ground shaken by men and what they did. Where he was coming from, they thought about killing day after day and feared it and did it. And out of the unending, unrelenting great noise and tumult of the killing went little deaths that belonged to people one by one. Some had feared it and had died. Some had died without fearing it, lacking the time. They had fallen around him until he was amazed that he stood. Men who in a little while had become his buddies, most of them younger than he, just boys. The fighting had been like work. Only a lot of people got killed and a lot of things got destroyed. It was not work that made much of anything. You and your people intended to go your way if you could. And you wanted to stop the other people from going their way, if you could. And whatever interfered, you destroyed. You had a thing on your mind that you wanted, or wanted to get to, and anything at all that stood in your way, you had the right to destroy. If what was in the way were women and little children, you would not even know it, and it was all the same. When your power is in a big gun, you don't have any small intentions. Whatever you want to hit, you want to make dust out of it. Farm buildings, houses, whole towns, things that people had made well and cared for a long time, you made nothing of. We blew them apart and scattered the pieces so they couldn't be put together again. And people, too, we blew them apart and scattered the pieces. <clears throat> he had seen tatters of human flesh hanging in the limbs of trees, along with pieces of machines. He had seen bodies without heads, arms and legs without bodies, strewn around indifferently as chips. 
He had seen the bodies of men hanging upside down from a tank turret, lifeless as dolls. Once when they were firing their gun, the man beside him, Ekstrom, began to dance, and Art thought, this ain't no time to be dancing. But old Ekstrom was dancing because he was shot in the head, was killed, his body trying on its own to keep standing. And others had gone down, near enough to Art almost that he could touch, have touched them as they fell. Jones, Bittmer, Hirsch, Walters, Corelli. He had seen attackers coming on, climbing over the bodies of those who had fallen ahead of them. A man who in one moment had been a helper, a friend, in the next was only a low mound of something in the way, and you stepped over him or stepped on him and came ahead. Once while they were manning their gun and under fire themselves, old Ekstrom got mad. And he said, I wish I had those sons of bitches lined up to where I could shoot every damned one of them. And Art said, them fellers over there doing about the same work we are, appears like to me. There were nights when the sky and all the earth appeared to be on fire. And yet the ground was covered with snow and it was cold. At Christmas, he was among those trapped at Bastogne. He had expected to die, but he was spared as before, though the ground shook and the town burned under a sky bright as day. They held their own and others fighting on the outside broke through. We was mighty glad to see that day when it come, he thought, that was a good day. The fighting went on, the great tearing apart, people and everything else were torn into pieces. Everything was only pieces put together that were ready to fly apart and nothing was whole. You got to where you could not look at a man without knowing how little it would take to kill him. For a man was nothing but just a little morsel of soft flesh and brittle bone inside of some clothes. And you could not look at a house or a schoolhouse or a church without knowing how rightly hit it would just shake down into a pile of stones and ashes. There was nothing you could look at that was whole, man or beast or house or tree that had the right to stay whole very long. There was nothing above the ground that was whole, but you had the measure of it and could separate its pieces and bring it down. You moved always in a landscape of death, wreckage, cinders, and snow. And then, having escaped so far, he was sitting by his gun one afternoon, eating a piece of chocolate and talking to an old red-headed, freckle-faced boy named McBride, and a shell hit right where they were. McBride just disappeared, and a fragment came to Art as if it were his own and had known him from the beginning of the world, and it burrowed into him. From a man in the light on the outside of the world, he was transformed in the twinkling of an eye into a man in the dark on the inside of himself, in pain, and he thought that he was dead. How long he was in that darkness, he did not know. When he came out of it, he was in a place that was white and clean, a hospital, and he was in a long room with many beds. There was sunlight coming in the window. A nurse who came by seemed glad to see him. Well, hello, bright eyes, she said. He said, why, howdy. She said, I think the war is over for you, soldier. Yes, ma'am, he said, I reckon it is. She patted his shoulder. You almost got away from us, you know it. And he said, yes, ma'am, I expect I did. The uniform he wore as he walked along the road between Jefferson and Hargrave was now too big for him. His shirt collar was loose on his neck in spite of the neatly tied tie, and under his tightened belt, the waistband of his pants gathered in pleats. 
He stayed, in the, he stayed in hospitals while his life grew back around the wound, as a lightning-struck tree will sometimes heal over the scar, until finally they gave him his papers and let him go. And now, though he walked strongly enough along the road, he was still newborn from his death, and inside himself he was tender and a little afraid. The bus had brought him as far as the town of Jefferson on the north side of the river, letting him out in the middle of the afternoon in front of the hotel that served also as a bus station. From there, he could have taken another bus to Hargrave had he been willing to wait until the next morning. But now that he was in familiar country, he did not have it in him to wait. He had known a many a man who would have waited, but he was old for a soldier. Though he was coming from as far as progress had reached, he belonged to an older time. It did not occur to him any more than it would have occurred to his grandfather to wait upon a machine for something he could furnish for himself. And so he thanked the kind lady at the hotel desk, shouldered his bag, and set out for home on foot. The muddy Ohio flowed beneath the bridge, and a flock of pigeons wheeled out and back between the bridge and the water, causing him, causing him to sway as he walked, so that to steady himself he had to look at the hills that rose over the rooftops beyond the bridge. He went down the long southward arc. Uh, he went down the long southward arc of the bridge. And for a little while, he was among houses again. And then he was outside the town, walking past farmsteads and fields in unobstructed day. The sky was overcast, but the clouds were high. It ought to clear off before morning, he thought. Maybe it'll be one of them fine spring days. Maybe it'll do to work, for I have got to get started. They would already have begun plowing, he thought, his father and his brother Mart. Though they had begun the year without him, they would be expecting him. He could hear his father's voice saying, any day now, any day. But he was between lives. The war had been a life such as it was, and now he was out of it. The other life, the one he had once had and would have again, was still ahead of him. He was not in it yet. He was only free. He had not been out in the country or alone in a long time. Now that he had the open countryside around him again and was alone, he felt the expectations of other people fall away from him like a shed skin, and he came into himself. I am not under anybody's orders, he thought. What I expect myself to do, I will do it. The government don't owe me and I don't owe it, except when I have something again that it wants, then I reckon I will owe it. <laughs> it pleased him to think that the government owed him nothing, that he needed nothing from it, and he was on his own. But the government seemed to think that it owed him praise, it wanted to speak of what he and the others had done as heroic and glorious. Now that the war was coming to an end, the government wanted to speak of their glorious victories. The government was made up of people who thought about fighting, not of those who did it. The men sitting behind desks, they spent other men to buy ground, and then they ruined the ground they had and more men to get the ground beyond. If they were on the right side, they did it the same as them that were on the wrong side. They talk about victory as if they know all them dead boys was glad to die. The dead boys ain't never been asked how glad they was. If they had it to do again, might be they wouldn't do it, or might be they would, but they ain't been asked. Under the clouds, the country all around was quiet except for birds singing in the trees, wherever there were trees, and now and then a human voice calling out to a team. He was glad to be alive. 
He had been glad to be alive all the time he had been alive. When he was hit and thought he was dead, it had come to him how good it was to be alive, even under the shelling, even when it was at its worst. And now he had lived through it all and was coming home. He was now a man who had seen far places and strange things, and he remembered them all. He had seen Kansas and Louisiana and Arizona. He had seen the ocean. He had seen the little farms and country towns of France and Belgium and Luxembourg, pretty, before they were ruined. For one night, he was in Paris. That Paris now, we was there one day and one night. There was wine everywhere, and these friendly girls who said, Kiss me. <laughs> and I don't know what happened. I don't, and I don't know what happened after about 10 o'clock. I come to the next morning in this hotel room, sick and broke, with lipstick from one end to the other. I reckon I must have had a right good time. At first, before he was all the way in it, there was something he liked about the war, a reduction that in a way was pleasing. From a man used to doing and thinking for himself, he became a man who did what he was told. That laying around half a day waiting for somebody else to think, that was something I had to learn. <laughs> it was fairly restful. Even basic training tired him less than what he would ordinarily have done at that time of year. He gained weight. And from a man with a farm and crops and stock to worry about, he became a man who worried only about himself and the little bunch of stuff he needed to sleep, dress, eat, and fight. He furnished only himself. The army furnished what little else it took to make the difference between a man and a beast. More than anything else, he liked his mess kit. It was all the dishes a man really needed. And when you weren't cooking or eating with it, you could keep things in it, a little extra tobacco maybe. When I get to Elville, he thought, I won't be but mighty little short of halfway. I know the miles and how they lay out end to end. It had been evening for a while now. On the farmsteads that he passed, people were busy with the chores. He could hear people calling their stock, dogs barking, children shouting and laughing. On one farm that he passed, a woman, a dog, and a small boy were bringing in the cows. In the driveway of the barn, he could see a man unharnessing a team of mules. It was as familiar to him as his own breath, and because he was outside it still, he yearned toward it as a ghost might. As he passed by, the woman, perhaps because he was a soldier, raised her hand to him, and he raised his own in return. After a while, he could see ahead of him the houses and trees of Elville, and over the trees the superstructure of the bridge arching into Hargrave. All during his walk so far, he had been offering himself the possibility that he would walk on home before he would sleep. But now that he had come nearly halfway and Elville was in sight, he knew he would not go farther that day. He was tired. And with his tiredness had come a sort of melancholy and a sort of aimlessness, as if all his ties cut, he might go right on past his home river and on and on anywhere at all in the world. The little cluster of buildings ahead of him now seemed only accidentally there, and he himself there only accidentally. He had arrived as he had arrived again and again during the healing of his wound at the apprehension of a pure emptiness, as if at the center of an explosion, as if without changing at all, he and the town ahead of him and all the long way behind him had been taken up into a dream in which every creature and everything sat like that boy McBride in the dead center of the possibility of its disappearance. 
In the little town, Elaine turned off the highway and went out beyond the houses and across the river bottom for perhaps a quarter of a mile to a barn and beyond the barn to a small weatherboarded church. It was supper time then. The road and the dooryards were deserted. Art entered the lane and went back past the gardens and the clutter of outbuildings that lay behind the houses. At the barn, there was a cistern with a chain pump. He sat down his bag and pumped and drank from his cupped left hand held under the spout. Looks like I ought to be hungry, he thought, but I ain't. He was not hungry, and there was no longer anything much that he wanted to think. He was tired. He told himself to lift the bag again and put it on his shoulder. He told his feet to walk, and they carried him on to the church. The door was unlocked. He went in. He shut the door behind him, not allowing the latch to click. The quiet inside the church was palpable. He came into it as into a different element, neither air nor water. He crossed the tiny vestibule where a bell rope dangled from a worn hole in the ceiling, went through another door that stood open, and sat down on the first bench to his left, leaving his duffel bag in the aisle, propped against the end of the bench. He let himself become still. I will eat a little, he thought, against I get hungry in the night. After a while, he took a bar of candy from the bag and slowly ate it. The church windows were glazed with an amber-colored glass that you could not see through. And though it was still light outdoors, in the church it was dusk. When he finished the candy, he folded the wrapper soundlessly and put it in his pocket. Taking his overcoat from the bag to use as a blanket, he lay down on the bench. Many thoughts fled by him, none stopping, and then he slept. He woke several times in the night, listening, and hearing no threat out in the darkness anywhere, slept again. The last time he woke, roosters were crowing, and he sat up. He sat still a while in the dark, allowing the waking quiet of the place to come over him. And then he took another bar of candy from his bag and ate it and folded the paper and put it in his pocket as before. The night chill had seeped into the church. Standing, he put on the overcoat. He picked up his bag and felt his way to the door. It had cleared, and the sky was full of stars. To the east, upriver, he could see a faint brightening ahead of the coming day. All around him, the dark treetops were throbbing with birdsong, and from the banks of the two rivers at their joining, from everywhere there was water. The voices of spring peepers rose as if in clouds. Art stood still and looked around him and listened. It was going to be the fine spring day that he had imagined it might be. He thought, if a fellow was to be dead now and young, might be he would be missing this a long time. There was a privy in back of the church, and he went to it. And then on his way out of the lane, he stopped at the barn and drank again at the cistern. Back among the houses, still dark and silent among their trees, he took the road that led up into the smaller of the two river valleys. There was no light yet from the dawn, but by the little light of the stars he could see well enough. All he needed now was the general shape of the place given by various shadows and loomings. I have hoofed it home from here many a night, he thought. Might be I could do it if I was blind, but I can see. He could see, and he walked along, feeling the joy of a man who sees, a joy that a man tends to forget in sufficient light. The quiet around him seemed wide as the whole country, 
and deep as the sky, and the morning songs of the creatures and his own footsteps occurred distinctly and separately in it, making a kind of geography and a kind of story. As he walked, the light slowly strengthened. As he more and more saw where he was, it seemed to him more and more that he was walking in his memory or that he had entered awake a dream that he had been dreaming for a long time. He was hungry. The candy bar that he had eaten when he woke had hardly interrupted his hunger. My belly thinks my throat has been cut. It is laying right flat against my backbone. It was a joy to him to be so hungry. Hunger had not bothered him much for many weeks, had not mattered but now it was as vivid to him as a landmark. It was a tree that puts its roots into the ground and spread its branches out against the sky. The east brightened. The sun lit the edges of a few clouds on the horizon and then rose above them. He was walking full in its light. It had not shone on him long before he had to take off the overcoat and he folded it and rolled it neatly and stuffed it into his bag. By then he had come a long way up the road. Now that it was light, he could see the marks of the flood that had recently covered the valley floor. He could see drift logs and mats of corn stalks that the river had left on the low fields. In places where the river ran near the road, he could see the small clumps of leaves and grasses that the currents had affixed to the tree limbs. Out in one of the bottoms, he saw two men with a team and wagon clearing the scattered debris from their fields. They had set fire to a large heap of drift logs from which the pale smoke rose straight up. Above the level of the flood, the sun shone on the small, still opening leaves of the water maples and on the short, new grass of the hillside pastures. As he went along, Art began to be troubled in his mind. How would he present himself to the ones at home? He had not shaved. Since before his long ride on the bus, he had not bathed. He did not want to come in after his three-year absence like a man coming in from work, unshaven and with his clothes mussed and soiled. He must appear to them as what he had been since they saw him last a soldier, and then he would be at the end of his soldiering. He did not know yet what he would be when he had ceased to be a soldier, but when he had thought so far, his confusion left him. He came to the mouth of a small tributary valley. Where the stream of that valley passed under the road, he went down the embankment, making his way first through trees and then through a patch of dead horseweed stalks to the creek. A little way upstream, he came to a place of large flat rocks that had been swept clean by the creek and were now in the sun and dry. Opening the duffel bag, he carefully laid its contents out on the rocks. He took out his razor and brush and soap and a small mirror and knelt beside the stream and soaped his face and shaved. The water was cold but he had shaved with cold water before. When he had shaved, he took off his clothes, and standing in flowing water that instantly made his feet ache, he bathed, quaking, breathing between his teeth as he raised the cold water again and again in his cupped hands. Standing on the rocks in the sun, he dried himself with the shirt he had been wearing. He put on his clean, two large clothes, tied his tie, and combed his hair. And then warmth came to him. It came from... And then warmth came to him. It came from inside himself and from the sun outside. He felt suddenly radiant in every vein and fiber of his body. He was clean and warm and rested and hungry. He was well. He was in his own country now, and he did not see anything around him that he did not know. I have been a stranger and have seen strange things, he thought, 
and now I am where it is not strange, and I am not a stranger. He was sitting on the rocks, resting after his bath. His bag repacked lay on the rock beside him, and he propped his elbow on it. I am not a stranger, but I am changed. Now I know a mighty power that can pass over the earth and make it strange. There are people where I have been that won't know their places when they get back to them. Them that live to get back won't be where they were when they left. He became sleepy, and he lay down on the rock and slept. He slept more deeply than he had in the night. He dreamed he was where he was, and a great warm light fell upon that place, and there was light within it and within him. When he returned to the road after his bath and his sleep, it was past the middle of the morning. His steps fell into their old rhythm on the blacktop. I know a mighty power, he thought, a mighty power of death and fire, an anger beyond the power of any man, made, made big in machines equal to many men. And a little man who has passed through mighty death and fire and still lived, what is he going to think of himself when he is back again? walking the river road before, below Port William that we would have blowed all to Flinders as soon as look at it if it had got in our way. He walked as before, the left side of the road, not meaning to ask for rides, but as on the afternoon before, there was little traffic. He had met two cars going down toward Hargrave and had been passed by only one coming up. Where the road began to rise toward Port William up on the ridge, a lesser road branched off to the left and ran along the floor of the valley. As Art reached this intersection, he heard a truck engine backfiring coming down the hill. And then the truck came into sight and he recognized it. It was an old green international driven as he expected and soon saw by a man wearing a trucker's cap and smoking a pipe. The truck was loaded with fat hogs headed for the packing plant at Jefferson. As he went by, the old man waved to Art and Art waved back. Sam Hanks, he thought. I have been gone over three years and have traveled a many a thousand miles over land and ocean. And in all that time and all them miles, the first man I have seen that I have always known is Sam Hanks. He tried to think what person he had seen last when he was leaving, but he could not remember. He took the lesser road, and after perhaps a mile, turned into a road still narrower, only a pair of graveled wheel tracks. A little later, when the trees were fully leaved, this would be almost a burrow, tunneling along between the creek and the hillside under the trees. But now the leaves were small, and the sun cast the shadows of the branches in a close network onto the gravel. Soon he was walking below the high water line. He could see it clearly marked on the slope to his right, a line above which the fallen leaves of the year before were still bright, and below which they were darkened by their long steeping in the flood. The slope under the trees was strewn with drift, and here and there a drift log was lodged in the branches high above his head. In the shadow of the flood, the spring was late, the buds of the trees just opening, the white flowers of twin leaf and bloodroot just beginning to bloom. It was almost as if he were walking underwater, so abrupt and vivid was the difference above and below the line that marked the crest of the flood. But somewhere, High in the sunlit branches, a red bird sang over and over in a clear, pealing voice, even so, even so. And there was nothing around him that Art did not know. He knew the place in all the successions of the year, from the little blooms that came in the earliest spring to the fallen red leaves of October, from the songs of the nesting birds to the anxious wintering of the little things that left their tracks in snow. From the first furrow to 
to the last load of the harvest. Where the creek turned away from the road, the valley suddenly widened and opened. The road still held up on the hillside among the trees, permitting him to see through the intervening branches the broad field that lay across the bottom. He could see that plowing had been started. A long strip had been back furrowed out across the field from the foot of the slope below the road to the trees that lined the creek bank. And then he saw, going away from him, almost out to the end of the strip, two mule teams with two plowmen walking in the opening furrows. The plowmen's heads were bent to their work, their hands riding easy on the handles of the plows. Some distance behind the second plowman was a little boy also walking in the furrow and carrying a tin can. From time to time he bent and picked up something from the freshly turned earth and dropped it into the can. Walking behind the boy was a large hound. The first plowman was Art's father, the second his brother Mart. The boy was Art's sister's son, Roy Lee who had been two years old when Art left and was now five. The hound was probably old Baller, who made it a part of his business to be always at work. Roy Lee was collecting fishing worms, and Art looked at the creek and saw in an open place at the top of the bank, as he expected, three willow poles stuck into the ground, their lines in the water. The first of the teams reached the end of the plowland, and Art heard his father's voice, clear and quiet, gee, boys. And then Mart's team finished their furrow, and Mart said, gee, Sally. They went across the headland and started back. Art stood as if looking out of his absence at them who did not know he was there, and he had to shake his head. He had to shake his head twice, to persuade himself that he did not hear from somewhere off in the distance the heavy footsteps of artillery rounds striding toward them. He pressed down the barbed wire at the side of the road, straddled over it, and went down through the trees, stopping at the foot of the slope. They came toward him along the edge of the plowland, cutting it two furrows wider. Soon he could hear the soft footfalls of the mules, the trace ends jingling, the creaking of the double trees. Present to himself, still absent to them, he watched them come. At the end of the furrow, his father called, Gee, and leaned his plow over so that it could ride around the headland on the share and right handle. And then he saw Art. Well, now, he said, as if only to himself. Woe, he said to the mules. And again, well now. He came over to Art and put out his hand, and Art gave him his. Art saw that there were tears in his father's eyes, and he grinned and said, Howdy. Early Roundberry stepped back and looked at his son and said again, Well now. Mart came around onto the headland then and stopped his team. He and Art shook hands, grinning at each other. You reckon your foot'll still fit in a furrow? Art nodded. I reckon it still will. Well, here's somebody you don't hardly know, Mart said, gesturing toward Roy Lee. And who don't know you at all, I'll bet. Do you know who this fellow is, Roy Lee? Roy Lee probably did not know though he knew he had an uncle who was a soldier. He knew about soldiers. He knew they fought in a war far away. And here was a great, tall, fine soldier in a soldier's suit with shining buttons, and the shoes on his feet were shining. Roy Lee felt something akin to awe, and something akin to love, and something akin to fear. He shook his head and looked down at his bare right foot. Mart laughed. This here's your Uncle Art. You know about Uncle Art. To Art, he said, he's talked enough about you. He's been looking out the road to see if you was coming. Art looked up the creek and across it at the house and outbuildings and barn. He looked around it 
and the blinding blue sky over it. He looked again and again at his father and his young nephew and his brother. They stood up in their lives around him now in such a way that he could not imagine their deaths. Early round, Barry looked at his son, now and then reaching out to grasp his shoulder or his arm, as if to feel through the cloth of the uniform the flesh and bone of the man inside. Well now, he said again and again, well now. Art reached down and picked up a handful of earth from the furrow nearest him. You're plowing it just a little wet, ain't you? Well, we've had a wet time, Mart said. We felt like we had to go ahead. Maybe we'll get another hard frost. We could yet. Art said, well, I reckon we might. And then he heard his father's voice riding up in his throat as he had never heard it. And he saw that his father had turned to the boy and was speaking to him. Honey, run yonder to the house. Tell your granny to set on another plate. For we have our own that was gone and has come again.